Dan Casita is a specialist defense and security consultant and is an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and the author of Toxic. He has held positions in the US Secret Service and White House Military Office. Dan is of Lithuanian ancestry and has long studied Baltic history. He is experienced in many aspects of physical, technical and operational security and has 20 years of experience in every aspect of CBRN defence across both military and civil sectors. He is also a liveryman of London, a supporter of NAFO and outspoken critic of the current UK government. Now we'll talk about that a little more in the interview because that has caused some political controversy in the UK recently. Dan, I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Well, glad to be here. And unusually, I've actually met you in the real world before, oh, uh, yes. before we get <laughs> to speak. Indeed. It's a, it's a shock to meet people in the real world these days. You know, five years ago, it was normal. Now it's a bit odd. Uh, we're going to touch on a couple of subjects because, of course, chemical weapons are a crucial part of Russia's terror warfare. So we're going to go through the military use, I think. But then it'd be great to touch upon um, Russia's use of nerve agents to threaten and take out its opponents. Of course, there's Syria as well. Uh, and then we're also going to touch on the origins of chemical agents and nerve agents, of course, going all the way back to the Second World War. And another specialist topic of yours, which I'm absolutely dying to unpack here, uh, is the occupation of the Baltic states mm. and the fact that resistance continued long after the formal end of the Second World War. So there's loads of different things. We're going to yes. hop around, but hopefully it will be compelling to the audience. But let's okay. start with Ukraine, shall we? Because okay. what were your fears when the full-scale Ukraine war began vis-a-vis -vis the use of chemical agents? Well, actually, I was more sanguine than most people because having studied chemical warfare for a very long time now, uh, it doesn't represent some sort of massive fundamental improvement over conventional warfare any longer. It, it actually doesn't. Uh, and historically, you know, if you look at the last 30, 40, 50 years of conflict, uh, chemical warfare is sort of a, a, an off ramp to the side from the progression of, of you know, war fighting power so i didn't see what it would buy anybody and i had some bitter arguments on twitter because you know rather a lot of people just assume that chemical warfare is obviously it's obviously better than chemical uh, uh than conventional weapons and i'm like it was february 24th 2022 and like you know what guys it's the middle of the winter do you know mustard gas is a solid <laughs> at that temperature <laughs> it doesn't do any good it's lobbing an ice cube <laughs> um and honestly, actually, the Ukrainian military isn't badly protected against uh, chemical weapons. You know, the, the, the places in history where we've seen chemical warfare actually be useful on the battlefield are in disproportionate conflicts where the one side doesn't have the ability to protect itself. So the Iran-Iraq war, uh, fighting against Kurdish irregulars, uh, you know, Mussolini invading Ethiopia, the Japanese invading China, those are all situations where... Uh, a numerically a numerically uh, inferior but technologically superior army uses them to try to gain some sort of advantage in the battlefield against a, uh, an enemy that can't defend against it. And none of those parameters really held up. And that also, uh, we don't have any indication that Russia has the industrial base for the amount of material needed to actually sustain chemical warfare. Because another thing is people seem to lack a sense of scale. In chemical warfare because you you get you get ridiculous statements like you know this would be enough sarin to kill a hundred thousand people you know um in practical terms you need many 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 tons of chemical agents to actually have effect on the battlefield and you need an entire supply chain and industrial infrastructure to make make that and believe it or not back before relations got so poor the u.s actually worked with the russian federation to disassemble their old chemical weapons and their own chemical weapons manufacturing facilities back under this cooperative threat reduction uh, uh, program that does exist in other places is pretty much moribund between the U.S. and Russia now. But, you know, lots lots of U.S. tax dollars got spent to take apart Soviet sarin factories. And we've got the receipts uh, and in, in a country that is, frankly, just a bit broke to rebuild it. And, you know, it's the sort of effort that would get noticed. 
So I, I didn't see it as a thing. Now, not everybody can make the pivot in their mind between that and, well, but they poisoned Navalny's underpants. Um, uh, again, that gets back to a question of scale because you, you, for purposes of uh, assassination, you could put the chemical warfare program in a large room with 10 scientists and hide that. You know, coming up with a vial of stuff to poison Navalny, uh, put, uh, you know, coming up with a vial of something to put on, you know, Sergei Skripal's doorknob is a fundamentally different thing than a warfare program. Whereas in a warfare uh, context, you would need not just tons, but thousands of tons, I'm sure, to make a difference. And if it's used at that scale, mm -hmm. what does history tell us that it's it's just as likely to backfire in some ways on your own troops? I'm thinking here, of course, about the First World War and the fact mm. that mustard agents would often be released and then blow back onto the oh. trenches of those that released them. You've got well, yeah, you know, yeah. You hit on a, you you hit on one of the reasons why. Uh, one of the numerous reasons why chemical warfare became a bit of a, like an off-ramp or diversion. Uh, every general, every colonel, every major, everybody in any position of authority in a, in, a, in a modern army wants weapon systems that are reliable and predictable, okay? Uh, and are generally usable throughout the year in a wide variety of climates and weathers. Now, chemical weapons are extremely var uh, variable in their effects depending on the weather, depending on what, what terrain they're used in, um, time of day. So if you start parsing out, you know, what hours in the day, what days in the year, what parts of uh, what parts of Europe, you know, and what seasons, what weather conditions, all of a sudden you have a category of weapons that, you know, in the right conditions are actually superior to conventional weapons. But those right conditions happen less than five percent of the time. And there'll be another 10 percent of the time where they might be as good as conventional weapons. And the other, I don't know, 85 percent of the time. They're actually less useful than conventional weapons, uh, and and that's um, no no nobody wants to spend a lot of money and risk the political opprobrium for something that is eighty five percent useless. Okay, and costly, uh, I imagine. I, I mean, producing yeah, agents much more than you know ammo. Co yeah, cost uh, costly um, has much more shelf life and logistic concerns. Uh, you know, the whole thing is a fact to deal with. Uh, you know, uh, nobody's invented a class of chemical weapons that some percentage of it doesn't leak. Um, uh, and that becomes a problem. You know, somebody, you know, a guy opens a storage bunker and literally falls over, you know, sick. Uh, you know what? That's actually happened before. OK, <laughs> uh, it was one of the many, many, many reasons why, you know, in the night starting the 1960s, moving forward, the U.S. Army said, you know, what? we don't really want this stuff anymore. And only this month. Actually, is the finally the last of the U.S. Army's chemical munitions gone? Not because anybody wanted to keep them, but because getting rid of them was a faff and and hugely costly. And another question, yeah. which I know this yeah. is in the sort of military sphere that may not, uh, you know, you may not necessarily be an expert on military tactics, but doesn't it also take quite a high degree of organization, logistics, and even sort of sophisticated military hierarchy in order to effectively deploy chemical weapons. Now, put this in the Russian context, mm. and sophisticated strategy is not something that defines the Russian army in modern times, is it? I mean, they well, have yeah. a vertical structure. They yeah. don't give authority down to the sort of yeah. lower ranks. I mean, do they not just cap they're not incapable of potentially using these? Well, well, yeah, yeah. That's 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 a very good point. Uh, uh, back in 1993, we cast your eyes back 30 years ago. I was basically the last lieutenant in the U.S. Army to go through the chemical target analysis module. Because literally, like the next week, offensive chemical weapons got taken out of the doctrine. Okay, I was literally the last guy in the last room where you know, with all the classified charts and tables, which were old and graying by this time, because they had basically been developed in the 1960s and not changed. Uh, well, neither had the weapons. Um, to actually do an effective chemical, you know, weapons attack, you had to line up a lot of variables, and you had to actually be quite uh, adaptable and have good visibility of the weather conditions, uh, you know, in a, in an operational area, you know, if, if, if I was the chemical warfare, you know, officer for an artillery battalion, I'd have to be pretty fast on my feet and keep adjusting my forecasts all the time to make sure it was actually a useful thing to do. And 
it required a lot of brain power, lots of working through charts and tables, um, you know, quite agile and a lot of sort of independent staff work at sort of brigade and battalion level to make it work. And that those brigade and battalion staffs just don't exist in the same way uh, in, in, in the Russian military. And so, you know, I could see where their doctrine would have quite easily been a very, very big, massive pre-planned chemical strike, you know, across an entire theater plotted, plotted, you know, you know, days or weeks ahead of time. Uh, but that would have been a huge, huge gamble because of which way the wind would have been blowing, you know? <laughs> so, mm. yeah, it's, I mean, I'm never, ever going to say you got to hand it to Saddam Hussein. I'm not saying that. Uh, but there was a, the closest we ever got in sort of modern warfare to people actually uh, effectively executing chemical warfare as a as, as an offensive doctrine and achieving the uh, tactical effects it was meant to do was probably the Iraqi army in the mid 19 uh, because they 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 got smart at it and they they figured out when to use it and how to use it and all that uh, and even then uh, the Iranians had a a a learning curve yeah so just like in the First World War you know casualties drop off like a rock as the other side learns defensive tactics you know all of a sudden the Iranians say you know what we really do need gas masks that work but more important let's not mass our troops in one spot in the early hours of the morning because that's when the air is most stable we're going to mass troops we're going to do it in broad freaking daylight <laughs> when, when when the atmospheric conditions are at least useful for 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 chemical weapons, stuff like that, even just dispersing your troops and being cognizant of which way the wind is blowing, uh, you know, things like that are very good defensive tactics. And that's the stuff that's in all the manuals. All the defensive stuff is still in the manuals. The offensive stuff got taken out of the manuals. But, you know, lieutenants, captains, majors, colonels in the Ukrainian army all have this, you know, you know, they may, it might not be the first foremost thing, but there'll be, you know, Appendix C of their infantry tactics manual be chemical warfare defense oh okay uh you know let's uh let's make sure that you know uh you know between 4 a.m and 6 a.m it's really really hard for them to strike us <laughs> and looking uh, at this defensive offensive split here now russia hmm. seems to have given up on major territorial uh, ambitions it does seem to be have really dug itself in uh along most of that front and spent hmm. the last six months in in doing so um, are sort of chemical agents in this context uh, less effective? Uh, yeah, as a as a choice. Yeah, yeah, uh, they they are less effective. The chemical weapons did not break the uh, deadlock on the Western Front in the First World War. Uh, they just ended up making life miserable for the people who were deadlocked in the front, uh, First World War uh, because the front lines were so close together. Uh, you read uh, "Goodbye to All That" by Robert Graves. Uh, he relegates chemical warfare down to, you know, a nuisance along with rats and cold weather and trench foot. Um, and actually, the statistics, the statistics bear it out. Uh, the, there's a really... Uh, a Colonel, uh, who's also a medical doctor, Colonel Gilchrist, who was a U.S. Army doctor, uh, did a historical study in the 1920s looking through, uh, you know, death and injury records from the First World War. And guess where get guess guess where the real real beef was on that uh, the Eastern Front and the Italian Front and the Italian Front almost entirely concentrated in the Caporetto Offensive where the Italians collapsed it was a mobile thing uh, you know this idea that chemical weapons are really good in static warfare is it's a it's it's a weird it's a weird logic loop well it's really good in static warfare because it was used in static warfare. Uh, yeah, it was used in the trenches, so therefore it must be good being used in the trenches. Um, no, <laughs> uh, you know, you look you look at the German army, for example. You know, more German soldiers died from cavalry saber injuries in the First World War than died from exposure to chemical weapons. That's an incredible statistic there. Yeah, and um, and looking at Russia's current use or non-use, because there has been speculation uh, in the press about the potential use of mm. chemical agents um 
is there any evidence that Russia has used them in this conflict? Or, or again, is it muddying the waters to create classes of terror weapons? Because oh, we also yeah, have yeah. thermobaric, we yeah. have cluster munitions. Well, there yeah. I, I, lots I mean, of nasty okay. things. Yeah, there's lots of nasty things going on, you know, and people get it, you know, people are keen to launch definitional arguments, for example, uh, about things like depleted uranium and white phosphorus. Oh, they're chemical weapons. Well, why? Because they're made out of chemicals. Well, uh, everything's made out of chemicals. If I, if I hit you with a stick, a stick is made out of chemicals. Nobody's going to accuse me of using a chemical weapon if I hit you with a stick. Uh, okay. So let's extend this out. You know, yeah, there actually are definitions of chemical weapons because if you're going to ban something, you have to define it. Okay. Uh, what we have seen, and the only thing we've seen, is relatively low level improvised use by the Russians of tear gas grenades. Now, Tear gas is prohibited in warfare uh, for a variety of good reasons, uh, largely because of ex exactly the same thing with, I've been seeing on social media. Oh, my God, they're using chemical weapons. OK, well, that's one reason why you shouldn't use tear gas then, because it does muddy the waters. Uh, tear gas could be used to could be mistaken for other things. It could also be used to sort of cover other things up, you know, so. There's a sort of slippery slope argument that people start throwing tear gas with each, against each other. Somebody's going to mistake it for something worse and just retaliate in kind, and it all gets messy. Um, that's in a 90-second nutshell uh, encapsulates why tear gas riot control agents are banned in, the, in warfare in the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, we could have a separate argument some other day about what why, uh, why they're still allowed in policing and security and you know personal defense in some countries but from a standpoint of warfare that's really the only thing we've seen uh we've seen some really kind of silly things uh we've seen oh my god these captured russian soldiers have gas masks that must mean they're getting ready for chemical warfare um basically every every army in europe every soldier carries a gas mask you know uh you know, ditto. Oh, we 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 captured a Russian army. You know, you know, ambulance, and it has has atropine, which is a nerve agent antidote. They must be getting ready there. You know, U.S. Army, British Army. You know, most NATO armies routinely field atropine as a nerve agent antidote. Yeah, you know, as a defensive measure. So we shouldn't we shouldn't get down this road of projecting def, de, defensive stuff that happens all the time and somehow symbolic or you know indicator of some sort of offense going to happen well let's turn uh, if if it militarily yeah. it's not hugely effective does it nonetheless have <coughs> does it have um a purpose as a terror threat as a yeah. way of instilling well, fear in your opponent? well well that's that's something that i've been meaning to write a i don't know maybe if i can't write a whole book on it i can at least write an article on it someday uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, uh, there becomes this, there becomes this weird sort of, um, circular argument and the circular argument goes roughly, uh, chemical weapons are bad. Well, why are they bad? Because they cause terror. Why do they cause terror? Because they're really bad. Okay. Let's sort of try to unpack that. What makes it any worse than getting, you know, I don't know, a bucket of, burning napalm dropped on you what makes it worse than uh you know getting shot in the head or you know or a thermobaric than... weapon i mean if yeah. you have the impacts of thermobarics they're absolutely horrific yeah so we've talked ourselves you know we i say we society modern society has talked itself into a corner about uh, and, and worked ourselves up into a froth about chemical weapons and that doesn't do anybody any good. Okay, I, I don't know how to unpack it, how to ration that back, because it, you know, it goes all the way back to the early, early productions of, you know, you know, All Quiet on the Western Front, which sort of, well, not sort of, greatly exaggerated the effects of chemical weapons. You know, a guy gets one whiff of phosgene, starts to choke to death immediately, right, right there. No, you know, whereas in reality, phosgene takes ten hours to work. Um, uh, I mean, there is a there is a something innate in the human psyche about being poisoned. We don't like being poisoned. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's something bad about the idea that you can't breathe. Uh, I don't know. I uh, 
when you get into the nerve agents in particular, though, I think there's a there's a there's a there's there's another way to look at this. Uh, nerve agents actually mess with the chemistry in your nervous system, and 99% of your nervous system is in your brain. Okay, these things literally mess with your head. Okay, so you can make an argument that nerve agents are a terror weapon because they cause anxiety and and confusion, uh, cognitive problems. You know, uh, and and, and I have yet, to, you know, I've yet to find somebody who was exposed to nerve agents who exposed, uh, you know, who re I've yet to see any reporting of any signs or symptoms that were, could be even construed to be positive, like a feeling of euphoria or intoxication or things like that, you know, uh, you could get that with some other things, you know, it's, it's almost always dazed, confused, uh, you lose the ability to speak coherently because your words come out in the wrong order. Uh, your sense of chronology gets messed up, you know, uh, you get short-term amnesia is very common. Uh, longer term, you get bad nightmares and hallucinations sometimes, um, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, insomnia. Uh, insomnia is a long-term uh, is a long is a, is a long-term effect. And we only know this now because of a very good long-term cohort studies of uh, people uh, exposed to relatively small amounts of stuff in Japan. Uh, we don't have a good cohort study of uh, of, of people in the in, in the Kurdish regions of uh, Iran and Iraq. Uh, we don't have good data on that. There is good anecdotal data. There's not you know really good body of scientific data on that. Um, and um, Syria, but, because you know it's reputed that a lot of people, uh, civilians, will come to that in a minute. Because I think the the images mostly we have are of attacks on civilians, but mm -hmm. their use was supposedly widespread in Syria, um, and, well, and yeah. Russia potentially having a hand in that. Well, yeah, and the, this the Syrian modality that most by, there's only been a handful of sarin incidents in in Syria, uh, and largely because you know uh, even the Syrians realized. You know they get they get they get their hands slapped a bit for the sar sarin stuff, whereas they don't really get their hands slapped for widespread use of chlorine. Uh, and chlorine gets used as largely a glorified tear gas. It's meant to flush people out of houses, out of shelters, out of bunkers into the open where they could get, you know, uh, yeah, they're vulnerable to uh, to conventional firepower. And what you get. You, what, what you have to what you have to view in the in the whole Syria conflict is the use of sarin and chlorine is in the act and the isolation. We have to view this as uh, a part of a broad spectrum campaign to make life in areas that aren't controlled by the regime unpleasant to live in. It's a drain. It's a, it's it's the they call it somebody called it the draining the sea strategy, uh, and it's right up there with bombing bakeries and marketplaces and schools and clinics. And attacking the water supply. It's all part of a you know multifaceted let's make life miserable in these areas that the regime doesn't control. And so uh to a certain extent, that's a little bit of a lesson that you know the Japanese sort of came up with in 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 the Second World War, because you know, us being you know in Western Europe, you know, we seem to we forget that there was a whole war going on between Japan and China long before, you know us folks you know in the west got in uh, into shooting each other and there were uh, the japanese were using a fair amount of chemicals on there there's at least one incident where the chinese managed to throw some back at the japanese but you know uh, uh an incident the japanese you know you know ultra nationalist uh you know commentators are very very keen to point at <laughs> but uh you know there was a whole bit of you know using chemical and a certain extent biological weapons to make uh Areas unpleasant to inha inhabit, you know, and a little bit of that went on in Ethiopia with the uh, with with the with the Italian invasion. Uh, so, I uh, so yeah, th so this is this is terror against civilians uh, as an adjunct to organized warfare between combatants. And so, you you hit on something there. It becomes, you know. For for a totalitarian mindset, perhaps the more appealing, and I say that on you know ironic quotations, the more appealing use case is is like that. You know, we don't have really any incidents or very few incidents in the uh, in the uh, Syrian war of chemical weapons being used on actual you know the Free Syrian Army or you know the actual armed rebels. We have it against the the rear areas, the uh, the, the civilians.
and you know, there was a fair bit of that that was going on in the uh, uh, Italian Ethiopian campaign. Uh, so, yeah, which is going to lead on to the next question, which, which I know where you're going with this uh, assassinations, you know, and it makes, you know, you know, use of use of toxic chemicals or radioactive substances like polonium. You know, when you start getting into acts of, you know, basically political ideological violence, terrorism, um, they just sit in a they just sit in a toolbox basically. Uh, they sit in a toolbox of you know guns and bombs and you know uh, falling out of a window. <laughs> uh, we haven't had anybody die of falling into a window yet, but you know it's possible, I suppose, too. Somebody will fall into a window, no doubt. Russian. <laughs> I mean, Russia has a whole list of techniques, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and uh, yeah. I think it's the chemical ones have gained the most traction from people's imaginations. I mean, firstly, yeah. because some of them have happened on foreign soil. We've yeah. got the Yenka, we've got the Skripals, but uh, also the, Gibra, the guy the in, uh, poisoned is yeah. extensive. Uh, yeah. Uh, although it's not as, as a percentage of, as a percentage of Russians who have met a unpleasant fate or have been severely injured uh, for in Corge les Ultra. Um, it's not, it's not an overwhelming percentage. It's, uh, it's, you got to put it in the context of the, the broad thing. It's, uh, you know, and I, I, I know people who've been trying to figure out the parameters here and kind of, you know, for example, in countries where it's routine for a lot of people to have firearms, it's quite easy to go, go shoot somebody. Uh, you know, you know, there's not a lot of firearms in the UK, so maybe it's maybe it's a little bit more convenient to use poison. Rarer, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, we have we have we have the instances of people who just died, and you know, and I tell you, if you're if you if you're if you're a wealthy Russian and you die in North Cyprus or I don't know on a beach in Thailand or you know someplace like that, uh, how good is the post mortem going to be? Uh, out jogging seems to be a popular one as well. I mean, how many oligarchs and bankers have died out jogging uh, when they seem to be well, perfectly helpful? Healthy? Well, well, yeah, but then again, you know, you look at the typical oligarch diet, don't know. I mean, you know, that, that, yeah, that was the thing that always struck me about uh, Sergei Stri Scripple. If this is the guy who just died quietly in bed with his, you know, age, you know, smoking, drinking, not the great healthiest diet, nobody would have thought twice about it. So... Something like the Scripple situation, you're going to say, mm, maybe the method is the message. That that really uh, struck me at the time. And yeah. um, I think yeah. people get very confused. Those whom the message is not for mm. are endlessly confused by the multiple narratives that Russia throws out. Well, but yeah. Uh yeah, I mean, those who yeah. the message is for, yeah, right, they 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 get it without any further uh, explanation, right? Yeah, yeah, because I mean, you can say what you want about the UK. The UK is full of Russians and are full of Russian money. Okay, now here's the thing: is rather a lot of that is not pro-Putin money. A lot of people a long time ago decamped and voted with their feet and brought some cases literally, some cases metaphorically, bags of money with them. Okay. Um, any decent anti-Putin plotting probably has at least a node or a nexus or an arm of it somewhere here in London, you know. Uh, so this is a warning to the uh, emigration stay out of politics, you know. Uh, we could argue possibly is this, um, you know, is was 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 Scripple also maybe a, try to you know, trick Theresa May and Boris Johnson into. Um, a cack-handed crackdown on 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 oligarchs, effectively an anti-Russian pogrom, which would have flushed money out of out of London and flushed oligarchs out of London, and some of that would have ended up in places where they would have been easier to get, because again, the, I'd say Thailand, North Cyprus, you know, places like that, much easier to go, uh, much easier for the Russians to go get the money that they think somebody uh, yeah uh, ran off with, because a lot of this is about money, you know. Uh, it's not all about politics. There's a lot of money that the Russian state thinks it is owed. Okay, <laughs> um, and and uh, you know, there's. I so... think the Russian state, you know, believes it owns everything. Yeah. And as long as people are compliant and toe the line and yeah. sort of almost like act as agents of the regime, that's okay. You know, it's like yeah. a it's like a franchise. 
uh, you know, yeah, Empire yeah. Incorporated. But the minute yeah. you stop towing the Kremlin line, you lose the right to, yeah. to those goodies. Yeah, yeah, and and somebody like Scripple, who would not have been on anybody's A list of targets, okay, to be honest, a best sort of mid league on the B list, okay, um, and typically, you know, traditionally, you know, pardoned pardoned exchange spies are are are, are, are kind of off the off the off the books, um, you know, so I don't even think it was about Scripple. If they wanted Scripple dead, he would have been dead a long time ago. I think it, it was really it really meant to. Uh, you know, scare and, others. Yeah, and uh, Lonnie, I think, is the same. I mean, I'm not sure they cared whether he lived or died. I mean, maybe mm. it's fairly miraculous that he did live through a chain of events, but I'm not sure they were that concerned. It was the message to well, other also, oppositionists. And in the case of Navalny and Skripal, uh, you you get certain sort of, I would guess, category advantages to using a nerve agent. Again. Uh, using an exotic nerve agent of clearly, you know, Moscow provenance does help send the message as opposed to this, something generic like cyanide. Um, but also, back to what I said, it scrambles your brains. OK, uh, it could have easily scrambled Navalny's brains. It doesn't seem to have, but it could have. Um, now, I have no special knowledge on where Sergei Skripal is or why nobody's seen him and he's never made a statement. It's quite possible that he's honestly, uh, you know, a basket case. Okay. Uh, we briefly saw his daughter and she made a coherent statement. But, you know, um, I have I've talked to people who have had actually quite minor exposures to sarin. And for years that they've had mental, you know, you know psychological issues. Uh, and you read uh, Murakami's book Underground, where he talks to a number of people who were uh, exposed to actually quite modest doses of sarin in the uh, Tokyo incidents. And some of these people, and just you know, he he wrote this several years afterwards, weren't all with it, you know. Uh, so you know, you could it could very well be, and probably I, almost certainly, you know, the authorities have tried to question Sergei Skripal. What happened? Where did you go? What did you do? And it might be he has no answer. You know. Uh, Maybe he doesn't know himself. Maybe there's no good well, reason why well, they well, targeted well, him apart well, from Well, no, and he, and he may he may not remember what happened that day, is what I'm saying. Uh, there, are, there are cases of people who in Tokyo turned up at their office, you know, quite obviously unwell, having been on the subway and they just can't remember how they got there okay <laughs> uh you know th so this is not unheard of in nerve agent poisoning now use the phrase a minute ago staying out of politics and of course we know that part of the deal that russians have with the putin regime is not to become involved in politics we saw uh, last week strelkov gherkin uh, mm. finally locked up not for the right reasons but because uh, mm -hmm. he'd announced that he was going to become involved in politics. Now, you yourself have had rather an interesting brush with politics recently. <laughs> um, yes. For those yeah. of you who have seen you speak about this in the real world, it's absolutely fascinating. Your case has been championed by Edward Lucas, who's the mm. prospective Liberal Democrat candidate for Westminster. Can you tell us a bit about the hot water that you found yourself in? Ah, uh, yeah, where to start with this? All right, it goes back a couple of years. As you mentioned in your introduction, uh, I'm an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. I'm not employed by them. It's a fairly arm's length arrangement. You know, I occasionally do consulting work for them. In 2021, they asked me to go and speak at a conference. You know, every couple of years, the UK MOD uh, sponsors this World Chemical Weapons Demilitarization Conference. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, with all, with all due respect to the people who go to that conference, it is the boring end of my business. OK, and uh, by boring end, I mean, literally, because there'll be d discussions on, you know, uh, drill bits to, uh, you know, uh, drill into uh, suspected chemical munitions that are dug up on the Western Front and things like that. I mean, it's that kind of thing. So I gave a. By my standards, fairly anodyne presentation on, you know, possible future scenarios where chemical demilitarization, demilitarization might be important in the future. Got mild acclaim for it and thought nothing of it. Now, flash forward to January of this year, the conference organizers, which are DSTL, important down the uh, arm's length bit of the uh, uh, the MOD that 
sort of running the conference, invites me back. We'd like you to come back and do an updated version, something similar to what you did before. Okay, fine. Uh, nothing here. I heard nothing, heard nothing. I heard nothing. I heard nothing. I heard nothing. Uh, oh, you need to submit an abstract. I submitted an abstract, heard nothing. Then in April, I get a stinker of an email saying, well, per cabinet office rules instituted in 2022, we've screened your social media and we have found that there is material that is criticizing government officials and or government policies. So therefore, you're not allowed to speak to the government audience now. To be I, clear, you're one of the foremost experts yeah. in the world. There's only a handful of people who yeah. are really eligible to speak at these events. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, it, you know, in, 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 in the pool of historians of chemical warfare, there's about three of us in the country, and one of them is retired. And the other is a guy named Brett. He was a bath, and he's a friend of mine. Uh, uh, and so this is a bit of a stinker. And so by all right, so I declare an interest here. Not only not only is Edward Lucas the candidate for city uh, city uh, of London, city of Westminster, he's been a friend of mine for over thirty years, and he is I, I actually live in his proposed constituency. And so he's one of the people I show this to. I show this to several academics and, and stuff like that, and like everybody's like. Oh God, this is bad. This is really bad. Did this actually come from a government, you know, email address? Oh shit, yeah, it comes from an MOD email address. Uh, you know, and so yeah, this is bad. And, and you know, honestly, other people were even more outraged than me. I was more stunned. It took me a while to get you know work from stunned into outraged. Uh, and we started agitating. Uh, and honestly, the political agitation because we got. You know, not just Lib Dems, uh, an SMP uh, MP, uh, several Labour MPs to rattle things around, and we got some disclosures and stuff out of the, you know, the cabinet office, and the stuff we got was just outrageous. Okay, I mean, we we rattled out the the alleged policy. It was outrageous. This policy, just a complete outrage. Uh, basically in talent. I mean, let's, let's spell it out for the audience. Yeah. It's anybody, irrespective of whether they're one of the world's leading experts yeah. on a particular subject, if in a totally disconnected fashion yeah. they've it, critiqued the government in any way whatsoever, well, we yeah. don't want to hear from them. Well, yeah, and it's a policy that basically extends the civil service requirement for political impartiality on the private citizens. And it does it by stealth because this was a secret policy, Okay. Uh, and why do we know it was a secret policy? Because they weren't going to tell us. Okay, we had to rattle it out of the cabinet office in response to parliamentary questions. Uh, and this freedom is just... of information requests, I think, as well, didn't you? At some well, point. yeah, I did a subject. I did a subject access request under data protection. Uh, rumbled out some interesting stuff, uh, but basically, uh, we weren't getting action on this. So uh, I did as what you know they would say in America. I lawyered up. Um, I. I assembled a, a legal team and we started threatening to take the government to judicial review. Uh, and basically at every every contact point between my legal team and the government legal department, because the minute you start suing the government, you know, it's the government legal department who puts up the solicitor and deals with you. Um, the government started cracking and folding on every, every point of contact. Um, which originally says, oh, yes. Well, the, so the first first bit was like, yes, we admit that uh, we were acting unlawfully. So now you have no case. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's like if I drive through a red light and the policeman stops me. Yeah, yeah, I did it. Now go away. <laughs> How does that work as a legal tactic? <laughs> does it suggest there are people in the government who are a little dare I say it, sort of unsupportive of their own policies. I mean, if they fold in this fashion, maybe that policy well, is not particularly popular. Well, well, it, well, it could very well be. could very well be that this policy was drafted, and there are more than one policy, by the way. There's at least 10, okay? Uh, we've Because we've ferreted out and deduced the existence of others based on other people's experience. Uh, I, the, the, the speed at which they folded suggests that uh, nobody with understanding the uh, the law was involved. Lawyers weren't involved in in, in drafting up these policies because you know, I'd love to be a fly in the wall when the government legal department says, "Wait, you wrote this? 
and you said this, this guy? Oh, God, no. Well, we got to cut bait on this. This is bad. This is really bad. <laughs> yeah. And so every time we push, we push back a little harder, they folded more. And so the state of play is I now have a written, fulsome apology from the chief executive of DSTL, the arm of the MOD, he says, yes, we, we acted wrongly. This is all very bad. I'm very sorry. Uh, and we have an admission that they acted unlawfully. We have an admission in writing from the government that my free speech rights were violated. Uh, we have you know, not one, but two policies at the cabinet office, the second policy on training and development events, um, which we didn't even know existed. Uh, both of these policies have been withdrawn for review. Um, and that's the state of play right now. And we're still digging because every time we dig, every time we rumble, we've, we find, we find other victims. We find other people who've been adversely affected by this stuff. Uh, and so I'm just the very thin end of a, of a wedge here. What is the uh, end result of something like this? So you've got a government yeah. that is enacting policies discriminating against experts. The sum total of yeah. these actions yeah. would mean that the yeah. government is no longer basing decisions on, you know, data-led, science-led, expert-led. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. a worry. I mean, that's yeah, where we seem to be, dare I say, yeah. even post-Brexit. Yeah, it's hugely worrisome because at the end of the day, one of the great, uh, one, of, one, of the, one, of the, one of the great sort of, I'm not going to say great. One of the prominent features of the civil services in this country is they are largely very educated, keen generalists. Okay, uh, high degrees of technical specialism is not encouraged in the civil service, and people get moved around. And people are meant to be generalists, um, but that only works if they can tap into specialty expertise. And uh, this works. This this works two different ways. If you come up with this. You, you, you come up with this policy that generates all this additional paperwork and vetting that you have to do to bring in an outside expert to speak, you just say, oh, it can't be arsed, okay? I, you know, I'm not going through three or five years of Dan's social media. It'll take me all week because he tweets 100,000 tweets a year. Because <laughs> that's what the policy said. It said, go to, you know, you know, you know fill out this checklist, you know, print out at least 15 pages, 10 to 15 pages of, uh, of search results from Google and, and, and make sure you've gone through three to five years of their, their, their social media output, including posts and articles. Like, uh, I'm a prolific, you looked at me on muckrack. Yeah, I've written a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, it's not a good use of the civil services money to you know spend a week reading my tweets. I'm, uh, you know, it might be educational for them, but it's not what we as taxpayers do. Now, not know what I'm paying for. No, definitely. yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the other side, you know, it makes it reduces the pool of experts. You know, if you want somebody who's a complete anodyne geek who is a single, single, uh, single subject expert in a very narrow niche who doesn't have an existence on social media. And there are perfectly normal, fine people like that. Fine, but you know, for you know, people like me who, God help me, I you know, I you know, I tweet about cheese and liberal Democrat politics and fly fishing and you know, you know, <laughs> uh, I tweet about stuff that goes on in my church. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd it's be a because... long day for somebody to troll for all that long. Well, it? yeah, well, so so you there are several aspects of reduction of the availability of expertise to public discourse and that's wrong and something else that that comes to mind here i mean edward lucas is someone who you know to 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 uh, nail the colors of the master someone who we're very much mm. hoping will win in that constituency mm, yeah. because of this very practical action-oriented approach um holding mm. the government to account it raises the question why you and he were the first to do this why this hasn't been done before. If this policy is, you know, months, if not years old, um, why aren't other people actually fulfilling their democratic duty on uh, sort of Labour and Tory sides? Uh, well, it's a good question, partly because the, the pernicious nature of blacklisting is the majority of victims will never know what happened to them. Uh, in my case, it seems to have been they invited me, and then somebody somewhere says, ooh, you, no, 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 we have to uninvite him, okay? Uh, and then they decide to uninvite me and exactly tell me why, you, you know? Uh, so I was both, you know, depending on you look at, lucky, unlucky, you know, fortunate, unfortunate. Circumstances were such that I actually had smoking gun proof that this was going on. 
whereas a lot of other people is rumor and innuendo and you can't you can't fight with rumor and innuendo very effectively and you can't frame a freedom of information or data request if you don't have at least a little hint of where to start that process. Yeah, I mean, you could you could make a hobby of firing off subject access requests at random around government departments and hope to get lucky. Um, I submit to you that for most people, that's not a fulfilling hobby. Uh, and some, but some of the some of the other victims of this stuff that we found, they have found out because precisely they did that. That's how. Uh, Dr. Kate Devlin, who's a robotics and AI specialist, uh, again, arguably an area that's probably more important than mine uh, for day-to-day -day life. You know, she only really found out because of subject access requests. She didn't have some smoking gun, you know, email from a senior civil servant. I had the smoking gun. I mean, effectively. So to answer your question why I led the fight, I was the one guy that they handed the live grenade to. Okay. And I showed the live grenade to Ed Lucas and like, Ed, what do we do with this live grenade? He's like, well, we're going to throw it right at him. <laughs> yep, and, so, and uh, you know, very fortunate that you uh, you know someone like that who 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 knows the system and knows the processes. To well, follow. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it raises the point of uh, sort of efficacy of governance here. Uh, if somebody actually were to seriously vet me, how would they think that I wouldn't be a fighter on this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they uh, probably didn't read your social media posts or really yeah, understand yeah. them in that instance. I mean, surely, surely the course of least resistance would have let me talk about the Chemical Weapons Convention for 20 minutes, give me a glass of bad house wine at the conference reception and send me on my way, and everything would have been easier. Hey, I didn't even really want to go to the conference. I pushed back a bit, you know. They could have just phoned me up and said, oh, dear chap, hey, you know, cock up on the agenda. We booked too many people. Would you mind laying off on this one? I said, yeah, fine. I would grab that like a vine and swung like Tarzan away from this whole thing. But no, I mean, they brought the fight to me. It's not like I went looking for the fight. The fight came to me. And, and it's not know, as if you're going to, you know, turn up with a big yellow Lib Dem hat with a rosette and sort no. of go full Petty Ash down on the stage, you know. I mean, no. you're, you're not going to be uh, political know, in that context. No, no. I mean, if 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 I was if I had a track record, that sort of thing, you know, I, I wouldn't blame them. Like, oh, that weirdo, he embarrassed himself at that conference in Croatia. No. <laughs> uh, or something like that. No, I've got, you know, I've got decades of going to conferences, you know, in my subject area and being perfectly nice and normal and, you know, well regarded. You know, so it's, as I said, it's a bit like being thrown off a bake off because you follow Tranmere. It's just a category error. <laughs> you know, um, but anyway, that's enough of, enough about this stink. Enough you know? of that. Well, we're going to put links. If people want to follow up on that story, we're going to put links in the description of the video. There are two more questions I really had, um, because okay. I know we're going to be running out of time soon. One of those is uh, the origins of chemical weapons and why mm. the Nazis is the most despicable regime in history. Well, mm. you could make the case that perhaps, you know, the Kremlin is, is an inheritor of that. The shocker is we discovered after the Second World War that they had an incredibly advanced chemical weapons program, mm -hmm. but had not actually used them. So that that's something okay. I'd like to learn more about. And then finally, we're going to end on this incredible story of resistance in the Baltics uh, okay. a decade right. after, uh, which is a very unknown story. I mean, I, I, I wasn't mm -hmm. fully aware of this. And I find it very fascinating in the Ukrainian context, yes. the idea of fighting back against Russian imperialism. So let's okay. let's tackle the sort of origins of nerve agents to start. Okay, uh, I'll give you sort of the the part of it. Uh, if you go cast your back, uh, mind back to Germany in the 1920s, having lost the First World War, one of the reasons why it, it lost was it started running out of food. So agricultural chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides are actually important to both the peacetime and wartime economy of Germany. Uh, there was a there was a and. Another lesson in the First World War was that they were easily blockaded. So things that you could produce domestically versus requiring, you know, imports. Now in the 1920s, uh, all the really good pesticides were, were things you made originally out of petroleum or nicotine. But even the nicotine, you dispersed it, uh, dissolved in kerosene, which of course is a petroleum product. Uh, so there was a push in German industry and, and their their chemical conglomerate, IG Farben, which IG Farben was about 85, 90% of the German chemical industry had been, you know, kludged together. Uh, 
in the pre-Nazi era, I should say, because we forget how, you know, it, there, there was quite a fair, fairly socialist strain in Weimar Germany. So this is a large national conglomerate that had been put together, IG Farben. Uh, IG Farben was working on categories of pesticides that didn't require much input from petroleum products. Uh, and so leveraging some work that had been done in, in Berlin at a university there, they started a, a, a branch of IG Farben started working on this category of chemicals called organophosphates. Okay. Now, organophosphates still to this day are, are, are you know, a, a family of uh, pesticides. Uh, and in the mid 1930s, this guy, Gerhard Schroeder, um, who had worked through hundreds of these organophosphates, stumbled upon one. I'm not say stumbled upon. I mean, systematically worked through the organophosphates and was making new compounds. Uh, came across a new organic. I mean, made a new organophosphate that was frankly too dangerous to use because it was going to kill the farmers and kill livestock. And that was the first military nerve agent. Uh, uh, he thought it was a failure, a commercial failure, even in sort of almost homeopathic dilution. It was very good at killing aphids, but also it killed all the test animals. Uh, so it wasn't something you were going to be able to use in agriculture. Uh, but we're talking now late 1936, early 1937. The military hierarchy in Germany is very interested in this. You know, this, is, this is uh quite frankly, a sea change improvement over the chemicals that had been available in the First World War. Uh, turned out to be quite expensive and difficult to make, particularly to mass produce. Uh, make a long story short, you know, once the war starts, uh, Hitler's economy starts lavishing money on IG Farben to build, you know, a factory to make these things. It, it's problematic scaling it up and getting to work. All these huge, huge growing pains in this, but uh, this very first nerve agent, a substance called Taboon, they made over 12,000 tons of this stuff. Uh, never used it. And there's a lot of reasons why it was never used. Uh, first of all, there was this fear of retaliation in kind, whether with nerve agents or other weapons, uh, other chemical weapons. And the defensive aspects of chemical, weapon, uh, chemical warfare had been neglected over the course of the war. There weren't enough gas masks to go around. And rubber to make gas masks was extremely short and needed for tires and fan belts and things like that. So there was an abject shortage of defensive equipment. Uh, and there was because nerve agents could be absorbed, not just through the respiratory tract, be absorbed through the skin. There was concern how to protect the horses because we, 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 we even to the very end of the war, there's a lot of horses that are involved in the German military. Okay. And you know, we 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 kind of forget that because we think panzers, but uh uh the German military used a lot of horses and there wasn't an easy way to protect horses against nerve agents. Okay. Uh Otto Ambrose, who was the uh he's literally the A in Saren. Saren's an acronym, by the way, and one of the more wicked chemists in, in, in history. Ambrose was pretty convinced that nerve agents probably would have been already invented in the West. Uh and it's kind of by fluke that they hadn't been. There had got there were guys who were sort of on the pathway to them. Uh, he had he had sort of wrongly deduced that the likes of Shell Oil, Dupont, Monsanto, ICI, one or more of those would have hit upon the uh, the secret. Uh, the Germans actually had spies in neutral countries reading technical journals and university libraries, on, and actually in Bern, Switzerland, reading patent applications and stuff like that. Um, from 19, early 1942 onward, U.S. patents on pesticides and articles and technical journals and pesticides disappeared completely, okay, because that was censored. So he sort of had one plus one equals 10 in his mind. Uh, in reality, the U.S. was protecting mass production secrets to DDT. DDT is an insecticide, but it's not a nerve agent. Uh, but DDT was critical to the war effort because of malaria, yellow fever, dengue, and things like that. And, you know, remember the U.S. is doing things like protecting the canal zone, uh, fighting an entire war in, you know, the South Pacific, the North Africa campaign. Uh, we forget that the sort of the southern half of Italy still had malaria those days. So uh, DDT was important to the war effort. And so the censorship effort to protect DDT ended up giving Otto Ambrose the idea, oh, my God, you know, 
they, they, they found the organophosphate. So if we can make a ton of it, they can make 10 of it, you know? So that's, that's the crux of it. There are also logistical reasons that would have made it difficult for the Germans to actually use the stuff because by the time they amassed a large arsenal of it, it was mostly an aerial drop bombs at a point where the bomber force in Luftwaffe wasn't very big anymore. Um, but, you know, there you have it. There's, uh, there you go in a nutshell. Then, the, then British, American, Russians all capture pieces, remnants of, of the program and are st stunned dumbfounded, shocked, amazed, and holy crap, thus resulting in a post-war arms race between East and West to try to build upon what the, what the Germans had already done. And you can read that all in my book, Toxic, by the way. There's uh, two chapters on that whole aspect of it. It is a fantastic book, and that uh, I think this is a, this is a nice intro to that. I strongly recommend people read this. And the last question relates to another book, which is not quite published but coming out. So hopefully this will be a strong teaser for yeah. that. And it's the Baltic resistance to uh, Russian occupation uh, after the Second World War. Yeah, uh, I've got a book coming out called The Forest Brotherhood, uh, and refers to the fact that in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in the local languages, partisan resistance generally got referred to as the Forest Brothers, all right, because, again, heavily forested places uh, is where they would hang out. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm half Lithuanian by descent, uh, and so this has always been a, yeah, a personal historic interest of mine. Uh, you know, my, my father's family originally, you know, my, my, you know, it was my great-grandparents immigrated. I don't have direct partisan ancestors, uh, but I've got almost certainly sort of second cousins once removed and things like that that would have been involved in the movement based on where the movement was strongest, where my ancestral villages were and things like that. So, but this is a, this is a bit that kind of, I'm not saying it's written out of history. It's sort of history sort of styes, often sidesteps around the three Baltic states. Okay. Uh, and interesting and horrible things went on in the Baltic states uh, during the war. Because uh, what you had was effectively uh, a, a, a triple sandwich of occupation. Uh, you had in 1940, the Soviet Union taking over the Baltic states at, by putting in effect their alliance with Hitler. Because, you know, you know we, we, keep, we keep forgetting in the West that for the first 600 something days of the war, the Soviet Union, Stalin was on the other side. Okay. All right. Uh, and in August 1939, just a week before the invasion of Poland, there was this there was this treaty, this alliance, and the secret protocol appendix to it was a division of lands in Eastern Europe, and the Baltic states were given to the Soviet Union. And so in, in 1940, uh, the Soviet Union takes over the Baltic states. Almost exactly a year later, the Germans invade. So you have a, depending which bit of the Baltic states, a three, three and a half year occupation uh, and then you got the Soviet Union coming back, uh, declaring a liberation. Uh, of course, if you're if you're a Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, you're like liberated. <laughs> no, we're just back to the first occupier. Um, and we're talking about Stalinism. Yeah, so the first, uh, so neither of these first. Uh, we're talking about Stalin, Hitler. So the you know, first, second, and third sort of occupations here were all bad in various ways. And so people ended up going to the forest and fighting. Now, some of them ended up fighting a, a little bit in the first occupation. Um, first occupation had caught everybody a bit, you know, by surprise. Uh, some people ended up fighting the Germans. Some people ended up fighting for the Germans. Some people ended up fighting against the Germans. Um, it's a mess. The Second World War is a whole mess in the Baltic states. There's probably a whole book to be written on that. Uh, Wicked, wicked acts of the Holocaust happened there with local collaboration, as in, I should say, everywhere. Uh, and then you get the Soviet Union coming back and, you know, doing things like collectivizing agriculture and stuff like that. So what you ended up having, uh, to make a very long story short, the, the period of the Second World War and the fact that the front went through and went back, uh, left a lot of angry people and a lot of guns, okay? Uh, and so a percentage of these angry people and they, you know, picked up a percentage of the guns and decided to fight, uh, to 
not necessarily restore their independence because he didn't think rather a lot of the partisan units were really just trying hold on to what they thought the, the sort of hope of eventual independence because they'd all assumed that there was going to be a World War III, that there was going to be U.S.-Soviet conflict, and therefore they could be, they could rise up in the event of that and help, you know, defeat the Soviet Union. So what you ended up with was a conflict in quite slow motion because you had small groups hiding in the forest. Uh, some of these groups did ver actually very, very little. Um, you know, a little bit, you know, here and there, raids, you know, uh, some of them, you know, really just existed to produce newspapers and just keep the idea open. And, you know, uh, some, but, you know, some of it was uh, fighting a defensive action on the, on, on behalf of peasants who were getting their, their farms confiscated, things like that. So what you had was a, a movement that was largest in Lithuania, uh, probably smallest in Estonia, uh, probably least organized in Latvia, uh, uh, to 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 make a a general uh, general um, assertion. Uh, well, several... not, not going to draw any sort of uh, you know nationalist no, 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 no. national stereotypes from that. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Uh, partly because uh, partly because uh, uh, Lithuania was the most rural, most heavily forested at the time, uh, larger population. Uh, the Latvia, the Lat, the Latvians were the most urbanized. Uh, the only thing at the time that counted as really properly a city in the modern sense was Riga. Uh, uh, the 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 Latvian, the Latvian partisan movement suffered several early setbacks and infiltrations by the by the Soviet state. Uh, before that, uh, sort of the nascent movement got really badly mauled by the Nazis. So they had some they had some key setbacks early on. Uh, the, the, the Estonians, a smaller country, smaller movement, you know, uh, but, you know, all these movements spawn some really interesting characters. And did it help? Uh, obviously, it lasted for a number of years. Yeah. But it must have become obvious at some point that World War Three wasn't going to happen, that this new yeah. state of affairs in Europe, which ended up lasting for almost 50 years. Yeah. Um, it must have dawned on people that that, that you know, they did they then shift on onto their national languages culture trying to keep that going under occupation well you had a lot of things you had, you had a lot of things i mean where did this all end i mean some of it ended up you know with i mean a lot a lot of it ended up with partisans just dying or being dragged off to prison okay um and so by dragging off partisans to the gulag that <laughs> actually just opened up another front okay because in the years after immediately after the death of stalin there were these there were these big uprisings in the gulag system uh and and a key factor to these uprisings in the gulag system were in fact uh not just baltic but polish and ukrainian uh nationalists you know a whole gulag system that had been set up to punish enemies of the state uh at a point where you know basically anybody could be considered an enemy of the state, then you start locking up you know, you know hardcore Lithuanian and Ukrainian combat veterans who really are enemies of the state, uh, and the system didn't really know how to deal with that. You know, uh, you know the, the 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 Gulag system survived as an oppressive system in part because the Soviet state relied heavily on conventional you know non political prisoners to be thugs in the system. Okay, it says I mean. How are you going to keep? How do you how do you maintain order in a prison camp of five thousand people if you have one hundred fifty guards? All right. Well, that one hundred fifty guards has to use three hundred, four hundred, you know, uh, you know, non political prisoners who get special conditions and you know aren't get treated as badly as their as their as their proxy force. Well, those those traditional criminals. Uh, they, they they seem to get away with carrying knives and stuff like that and beat up and you know the the political prisoners. All of a sudden, you get these basically hardcore killers uh, who just aren't taking it. You know, so all of a sudden, wait a minute, these political prisoners aren't cowed anymore. You know, uh, you know, uh, three Estonians just killed one of our guys. <laughs> you know, uh, and so this flashed over in several places where effectively the traditional criminals down tools and joined the political prisoners. And you had 
uh, tremendous uprising. The most infamous was in a place called Kengir and now in Kazakhstan, but it happened in several other prison camp complexes. And it's not well known. It's well written by Solzhenitsyn, uh, who interviewed several of its uh, participants. Uh, so, you know, you get basically part of the uh, Forest Brother movement, you know, opens up a new front in Siberia. Uh, some of it is people just give up the fight, uh, try to melt back into society. Uh, I mean, by 1950, 1951, there weren't many partisans left hiding the woods. And they realized that this whole war in Korea has happened. There's been, you know, uh, uh, yeah, this this World War Three isn't going to happen anytime soon. If it was going to happen, it's going to happen. Then the blood of wool goes up and that is yeah, the end of that. Yeah, yeah. And so I, it's not that there's a direct line between sort of what I would call the there's not a there's not a direct lineage really between the partisan movement and the later on 60s 70s 80s nonviolent movement uh because to a certain extent that movement already existed in the cities the, a proper dissident movement you know cranking out newspapers you know uh, and all that that happened in parallel with the partisan movement uh and it just managed to sort of survive okay uh and again you get in the 60s all of a sudden you know you might just get a slap on the wrist in a you know three day interrogation and you know you know maybe you lose your job. You might not get shot if you get caught you know you know with an underground newspaper. Okay, uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, one tangible effect was uh, it delayed it it delayed the and particularly in Lithuania it delayed the. Uh, collectivization of agriculture in the countryside to the point where basically then Stalin died and all of a sudden you know, the state isn't willing to use the same coercive resources. So the demographics of Lithuania remained largely Lithuanian as opposed to uh, uh, demographics shifted more in uh, Estonia and Latvia. And some of that is some of that has to do with the fact the urban versus rural thing. That became urban. You know, the 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 ethnic Russians and Ukrainians stuff brought in largely urban areas because of the natures of the pre-war economies. So, you know, I you know, again, that's kind of the whole last chapter is sort of laying out this. Yeah, what did it matter? Uh, um, and it's a fascinating history. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm... it is. Yeah, and to what to what end? I mean, uh, to what end? It's still debatable. I mean uh open for discussion uh you know certainly certainly you know resistance movements both you know sort of you know nonviolent and violent uh kept the ideas of independent countries alive um it a huge impetus in all three countries was to stay in touch with the with the uh with 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 baltic peoples in exile okay uh, and those channels didn't go away with the end of the partisan movement. And so, the, so the, you know, there was there, there there was a lot of going and froing between you know you know Lithuanian dissidents and and their colleagues in the West. You know, and I think the most interesting aspect for me, at least, is using the knowledge of what happened in the past to understand Russia's behavior in the present, because. With every new atrocity, with full-scale war, with mm. European butcher and all these horrors, mm. there seems to be a collective surprise every time Russia does something. And it's like, if you had even an inkling of awareness of how Russia has behaved in the past, yeah. none of this is a surprise. You could predict it step yes. by step by step yeah. and counter it. Yeah, none of this is a shock to a guy like me of Lithuanian heritage. None of this is a shock at all. Uh, I, you know, these people who just sort of are constantly shocked and amazed by this, I don't know what world they've been living in. Uh, you know, though, we're sort of this, oh, ah, basically Russians, yeah, they're, they're civilized people, they're Christians, they're white, they, therefore they're just like us. Um, I think mean, Russia's a fascinating place. I, I spent, I spent three years learning to speak Russian as an undergraduate, you know, I, I, I you know, actually... You know, I spent six months in Moscow as a graduate student in the early 90s. And, you know, I'm not a Russophobe, uh, but I've met a lot of unaccountable, uh, I, for, for, for lack of a term, unaccountable Russophile. You know, it's like, okay, 
I actually really like Russian literature. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the same thing happened in the 30s with the Germans. Oh, the Germans, they're civilized people. We'll sort all this out, you know. Uh, I don't know. It's, you know, I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> uh, that's probably more of a question for Ed Lucas than it is for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I can do is recommend to people to read both those books and uh, we'll pop a notice on the channel when it comes out, when it's available, people can sort of buy it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yes, knowing your enemy, knowing their actions in the past, knowing their behavior and listening to Ukrainians, listening to people from the Baltics who can tell you what's really going on for me. I think that mm -hmm. is the the big lesson in all of this. Listen to those mm. that know rather mm. than falling back on our own, you know, projection of our own behaviors and frameworks yeah. and assumptions. That's the most dangerous. And it's still going on even after a year and a half of war. Yeah, you could you could tell some you could tell a lot about somebody by asking what their neighbors think. That is a fantastic place to end. That's a really sort of punchy thought to take away there. Dan, uh, this has been a brilliant conversation. I'm oh, so grateful you. you to spending time, so much time this morning to uh, regale us with, with all your expertise and stories. And everyone, please do read your articles and your books. They are fa oh, fabulous. You. And uh, if you get a chance to see Dan in the real world speaking, it is also extremely compelling. All right. Well, thank you so much.